morning, so New York. Thank you very much for having woke up so early for this uh, session. We're not into a very heavy topic because everything about China is so easy these days. So I guarantee you will be feeling very good in about 20 to 25 minutes. You know, we are a country that's not even 250 years old. And uh, China, on the other hand, is 5,000 years old. But it feels like since 1978, it just only started open then. So it feels like a 5,000-year-old person going on 40. I guess that means the country itself might be a little bit confused about itself. So while it's very popular and very bipartisan to criticize China these days, it feels like we need to better understand China so we can criticize China better. At least we can criticize China the right way. Now, it's very timely because one of our leading minds on this panel, Dr. Jing, is launching her book called The New China Playbook, actually right here on site, and also with quite a few prestigious organizations and media outlets in the United States. So I want to pose a question to not only Ke Yu, Dr. Jin, but also to my friend Andrew, who's the other leading mind on everything about China and the Chinese economy traveling from DC here. So the first question is, in order for us to be data-driven and facts-based, could you, what would be the top line you would describe, you would use to describe China today? I think it's important to separate hype from reality, to separate the macro from the micro, to not read too much in the messages, the loud messages, the grandiose projects, either in the US or China, and to look at what's actually happening on the ground. So simultaneously, there is a severe loss of confidence, which is the reason why China has not rebounded as quickly. At the same time, there is galvanized creativity and innovation uh, at the local level. And these things, two things can coexist. Andrew, what do you think? Do you agree? I do agree. And I'd say, I mean, the, the way we approach this is we just look very closely at what China is saying about itself and to itself. And what I mean is we look at primary source documents in Chinese to understand what the government and the party is saying and doing. Um, if you do that, you get a very different understanding of what's happening in China than if you read the Western press. There's always been a a disconnect between looking at China from abroad and understanding China on the ground because of the COVID pandemic, I think that disconnect has grown wider and wider and wider. And the last thing I'll just say, and I mean, obviously like not everyone can do this, but there's a reason that the intelligence community in the US says the first level of encryption in China is Mandarin, right? <laughs> if you can't read Mandarin, you can't understand what's going on in China. Um, and so we just looking at primary source documents uh, gets you a much better sense of what China is trying to achieve in its various you know, policy initiatives. Interesting, interesting. Now it feels like besides the differences between English uh, and Mandarin languages, there's a lot of communication issues between the two sides. It kind of falls into this uh, very traditional uh, fallacy of what you say is not what they hear, and that goes both ways. Uh, Andrew, do you agree with that? Do you see that there's a major gap in communication between the two sides? both on the economy, but also in general. Absolutely, well, there's obviously been a breakdown in communication over the past uh, several years with first the Trump administration, now the Biden administration, not talking to the Chinese um, as much, especially at a, at a high level. Um, but also we see this, like personally see it, many of our clients are in the corporate space, multinationals, and I've never seen a bigger disconnect between what local government affairs teams think is happening in their business and what external like headquarters uh, government affairs teams thinks, think are happening. So again, there's just, and a lot of that's just because people haven't been able to travel to China, right? So that, you know, we're hoping that this year with China opening, everyone gets to get back and those at least people to people exchanges can start to pick back up. Can I also add that um, there is, you know, the Mandarin might be the first level of encryption. There's also cultural and historical differences that we economists tend to want to shove under the rug and say they're not important, but they are. And it's mostly, you know, it's very prominently reflected in the US-China understanding of each other. 
the perspective, Chinese perspective of the U.S. and the U.S. perspective of China, if they, they could improve and, and, and that understanding, I think relations could be substantially improved. And just to give you an example, so culture and history also features in part of my, my book to look at that lens to the economy. Um, you know, the Chinese people expect their government to do a lot of things, expect the government interventions. Um, the implicit contract between the emperor and the people for thousands of years was in exchange for your deference, but not blind submission, deference, uh, the government is held accountable on offering many things. So some countries would look at you know, state intervention as totally unacceptable and intolerable, whereas it might be expected in others. That's just an example. Andrew, how do you think about that? Because one could argue that we're in a very messy democracy, but it's a democracy nonetheless, and China is not a democracy, but it occurs to me that if you're really on the Beijing-Shanghai high-speed rail, you will feel the efficiency of infrastructure improvement and so on. So Andrew, when you advise your clients, uh, including some of the people in the audience here, how would you help them reconcile and better understand that? Well, again, I think when we look at China from abroad, we often look at it through a Washington DC or a New York lens, right? We assume that Xi Jinping wakes up in the morning and the first thing he thinks about is what's going on in the US. That's not true, right? He has a laundry list of things to deal with. The US is somewhere on that list, but it's not at the number one spot. Um, so just you know, encouraging people to, as you said, get out beyond the Beijing-Shanghai corridor but also to just understand what China is trying to say about itself in its own on its own terms. Again, uh, just the a lot of people think that China is a total black box. But if you you know not to harp on this too much, but if you just go read the policy documents and high level statements that are that they put out, there's a lot of detail about what they're trying to do on the net zero transition, on you know, developing rural areas, on 5G, et cetera. And so, you know, they're spe they're 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 putting it out there because policymakers have to share that information so that things can get done. Right. And so I think just kind of understanding that we can know more about China than we think we can if we look through China's own lens is an important place to start. Yeah, Washington seems to be monitoring that quite closely. If you look at the Chips and Science Act, it feels a little like Chinese style subsidy written all over the place, actually. So maybe the socialism with Chinese characteristics and capitalism with American characteristics are kind of overlapping a little bit. Uh, maybe, well, that's a bold statement. So we we'll let uh, the policymakers on both sides determine that. Could you, uh, when you look at the macro economy in China, $18 trillion in size, growing at four to five percent according to the Chinese policymakers. That's roughly a trillion dollar in newly created economic value every single year, a trillion dollars. So who exactly is benefiting from that one extra trillion dollar a year? Well, that's certainly something hard to quantify because the trillion dollars spreads around and creates uh, multiplier effects around the world as well. Um, but what we do know is that, uh, what we know is that where it's not getting to, and uh, the Chinese economy is in a pretty poor state. Um, there are not enough jobs, uh, or you know, the youth unemployment, 20% uh, of high youth unemployment, 25% of students with uh, college degrees last year didn't uh, find a job. Uh, those are, the, I think that more than demographic aging is current China's current pressing problem. I do not agree with the view that China is going to become Japan in the 1990s and the Chinese economy will stall or collapse. But the pressing issue of the today is how to get this most productive and highly educated uh, generation uh, to find, to, to meet their expectations. Andrew, what do you think? I think Kuyu's exactly right. I mean, obviously, over the past you know decade, one of Xi Jinping's signature initiatives has been uh, anti-poverty campaign, right? So that's one area where the economy has really benefited. But the challenge right now, exactly right, is youth unemployment. I view that as sort of a mismatch between the types of jobs that China is currently providing and the types of jobs that you know young graduates typically want. Um, and that's a structural issue that obviously policymakers are going to have to deal with. And I think you know, the whole focus most recently on industrial upgrading is a lot about creating those higher, obviously higher value uh, production, but also higher value jobs that recent grads want. And that's just going to take time to 
to and filter. If, if I can add, you know, look at what China's aspiration is uh, is to be in the future, right? It's not to displace the U.S. as the great economic military power. It's you know still stuck in the middle income trap potentially, 600 million people with uh, less than 300 dollars of income per month. Um, you know. This is not something the U.S., which is a rich country for the last 100 years, can relate to. This is a middle-income domestic economic challenges. But even in terms of technological aspiration, it doesn't see the U.S. being, you know, it sees the U.S. as being a financial-driven knowledge economy. That's not the aspiration. The aspiration is to become a bigger Germany. But using modern technologies, smart manufacturing to upgrade in the value train, to use AI data uh, communication to do smart manufacturing, there's kind of an intimate, you know, uh, inspiration from Germany's managed kind of as Germany style uh, capitalism and uh, technology. So the emphasis on technical industrial power and related to the previous question, there's going to be 25 million manufacturing manufacturing jobs that won't be filled in the next three years. And here we're talking about demographic aging and too few people in the labor force and a Japan. How do you fill in these technical jobs? Is the leadership's, uh, Chinese leadership's uh, one of the focal areas? So they're expanding vocational schools, expanding service sector, et cetera. Um, so there's a big gap in understanding of what China, China aspires to become. Interesting. Now, we have a, a lot of GPs and LPs in the audience here, and, and maybe also online. Um, how would you describe China for the investment community? Would you call China a trade, or would you call China a law and hold? Andrew? I, I think it's becoming more complicated, um, and people are rethinking. I, I don't like that answer. Okay, Go ahead. okay, okay. <laughs> what I mean is the, the, risk, the risk calculus has changed. It is becoming more risky, mostly because of geopolitics. And, and as growth slows, the returns are, are getting lower. So you have to be um, more a savvier uh, investor to, to invest long in China now. Um, before, you could just commit capital and the place was growing so quickly that you didn't have to be that smart to, to get a good return. But it's, it's a much more complicated picture now. Can I, can I just add a little bit of context? I think there is a big, um, there's a lot of confusion about China's economic and business environment today that I just wish to say a little bit about. You know, there is, there could be a coexistence. Things that are seemingly irreconcilable to the Western eye can coexist in China, which means on the one hand, you have on the top the common prosperity aspects of more equitable growth, more, you know, uh, regulations and monitoring and even crackdowns on companies. At the same time, on the ground, the pragmatic approach of embracing companies, private companies, enabling private entrepreneurs because they are firmly in the driver's seat today in China. They need to do all the heavy lifting. They are the ones that provide jobs and give the and and um, fill up the local coffers that can all coexist so if you are willing to be patient enough to look you know beyond the headlines to look at china's vast economic technological landscape where there are thousands of autonomous vehicle uh, companies and hundreds of ev companies and chip industries and even the non um, geopolitically sensitive consumer industry, that vibrant landscape beyond the headlines, uh, it might be a long and hold uh, trade, a uh, long and hold investment for you. Can you give us an example, could you sort of on the ground, which seems to be the angle from your uh, New China Playbook, where the government and let's say a technology innovator actually work with each other for better or for worse. Any examples you can share with us? Uh, you know, the, the one big misconception about China is dominated by a central government, and it's just not the case. They set the messages, they set the grand objectives, they set the strategic autonomy, uh, a, a strategic direction, but then everything else is down to the ground, the local marriage between local chiefs like mayors and entrepreneurs. So example, the EVs, the electric vehicles, which is now China's gonna become the biggest exporter next year. How did that happen within 10 years? Local mayors around China, you know, all over, spread around China, are enabling the local entrepreneurs, building industrial supply chains, helping them coordinate industrial supply chains, helping them core bank financing, getting them talent, um, you know, from battery makers to manufacturers to control system, building all that out. And the state rolling out four million EV chargers around the country, uh, two million in the last year, 140,000 only in the US. 
Okay, that's a big difference. And they have enabled the whole sector. And we can look at renewables, we can look at other technology, and it's the same model. Again, there will be waste, there will be inefficiencies, um, but I think by and large, um, they have provided that, they have played a very positive role. Andrew, you agree with that? The role between the government and the business there? I mean, obviously, they, they come from a different starting place, right? I mean, there is more direction from the state, but I do 100% agree, having lived there for 10 years, that the place has an incredible entrepreneurial spirit, um, that there are people out there working hard to you know, be innovative and make their own businesses. And that's not because Lee Ke Chung, the former premier, said everyone needs to be an entrepreneur. It's because they, just like people everywhere, want to start interesting, innovative businesses and make money. And so I think the areas where we uh, just discussed, particularly around NEVs, renewable energy, the entire net zero um, transition is, you know, very innovative space in China. And you, you can't get that innovation from top, top level design. The next question is a little tricky to both of you as macroeconomists. And uh, Ke you mentioned hype and reality here. There's a lot of hyping going on with uh, our beloved Western media when it comes to China or in general. And we invented this term called alternative facts, where you know, people can view the same set of facts with different set of eyes. If you were to advise the Western media here about reporting on China, what would you say to them? Um, not be selective to look at the whole, um, uh, you know, report the, the problems, but also the good things. Uh, it's underrepresented. Andrew? Yeah, I mean, I, the, the secret about most of the Western reporting on China is that um, foreign correspondents tend to go through Beijing and Shanghai very quickly. And so most of the people reporting on China have just been doing it for two or three years. They're just learning. Um, there's a handful of people who are really good looking at China. So that's just something for everyone to know is that there's always newbies on the beat. But additionally, I'd agree, like often the best journalists are the ones who do try to understand China on its own terms and not report, you know, only on China as it potentially reacts to Western actions. Now we're into this last one minute, which is the most exciting part of this panel, which is the lightning round. So the two panelists can only answer my question with yes or no, or both or neither. So let's see how uh, they will react to this. Question number one, we'll go with Sakuyi first and then Andrew uh, second always. Will China hit 5% GDP growth target this year? No. Yes. <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> Will China survive the current chip challenges? Yes. Yes. Will U.S. outbound investment review, the upcoming executive order from the White House, succeed and be effective in containing China? No. Mm, I'm going to say no as well. Did you say no? No. Okay. All right. <laughs> Will there be a war surrounding Taiwan in the next five years? No. No. Take note of that. Will there be a different attitude uh, and also different policy towards China between the United States and our Western allies in Europe? Yes. No. Is there going to be more uncertainty or more certainty with the Chinese economy this year and next year? Same. More certainty, I think, actually. Should we look at China today more from the lens of a governance model that favors national security or favors economic growth? Economic growth. Xi Jinping says both. <laughs> what do you say? I agree with Xi. <laughs> <laughs> Who will make the first move to stabilize the relationship between the United States and China? Both. Both. Final question. What is your favorite city? New York? Washington, Beijing, or Shanghai? London. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Andrew? Beijing. I lived there for 10 years. Love that place. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our two leading minds on China. <laughs>